Greetings, I am Benjamin Jacobs, host of Wittenberg to Westphalia, The Wars of the Reformation. My show aims to use the wars of religion to examine the early modern period of European history. But most people don't actually know what the early modern period is or how it came about, so I actually started with the geographic formation of the European peninsula in the days when the earth was young and the coasts were straight. I guess that's why my show has been going for nine years, has 85 episodes, and I still haven't finished the introduction. Some people might say this is a weakness, but I'm having fun, and apparently people listen, so you might enjoy it as well. Wittenberg to Westphalia, The Wars of the Reformation. It's a show. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, Episode 11, Foundations of a State. When we last left Philip the Bold, he was being asked politely, yet firmly, to end his regency over Charles VI. He had also been consolidating his inheritance from his father-in-law, Louis of Malle, and began the Burgundian envelopment of the Low Countries. Thus far, I've been relating the narrative history and sprinkling in bits about how society was structured and how the government functioned where I felt it helped. But all in all, I have mostly neglected the state apparatus, at least as much of a state apparatus as existed in the late Middle Ages. So, let's remedy that now. Before I get started, I want to highlight my main source for this episode, Richard Vaughn's biography of Philip the Bold, specifically the chapter on the Burgundian state. I have been leaning heavily on this book for the show so far, but this episode, more than previous ones, will be based mostly on this book. While a lot has been written on the later Burgundian state apparatus under Philip the Good and Charles the Bold, much less has been composed on its origins, and Vaughn's book remains one of the best sources on it during the reign of Philip the Bold. Vaughn's book isn't the only source I use for this section. I'd also like to highlight Medieval Flanders by David Nicholas and Magnanimous Dukes and Rising States by Robert Stein. However, these books and the others that I used you can find my sources listed on the podcast website, by the way. Don't focus on early Burgundian government the same way, and so make up a smaller part of this episode. Additionally, I will be using a fair amount of French terms in this episode. I'm hoping that my pronunciation won't embarrass me too much, and won't cause the French speakers in my audience any pain. But if it does, you've all been warned, and know that I am trying not to get things terribly incorrect. Emmanuel Dubois from the Lafayette We Are Here podcast graciously offered to help with some of the pronunciation, so he deserves credit for much of what I might get right, while I'll take whatever blame there is for my inevitable errors. So, by the time that Philip, but technically Margaret, took possession of Louis of Mala's territories, he had already been Duke of Burgundy for over 20 years. As mentioned before, the Capetian House of Burgundy had spent the previous three centuries building up the power of the office of Duke and the institutions that he could use to wield that power. Back in episode 3, I mentioned that the Capetians had established a Parlement in Bonn, but that was only one level of the feudal administration. Before I move on, I want to give a quick definition of Parlement, as I will be using the word quite a lot this episode. Parlement were courts of justice and appeal throughout France. They often had other duties related to administration, such as acting as a clerk's office. A parlement could be independent from the king or the high nobles of whatever territory it was in, but more often than not, a feudal lord could make his influence felt at their regional parlement. The highest of these was the Parlement of Paris, which served as the final court of appeals in France, and was an important tool that the kings of France used to exercise their authority and expand their influence. In 1384, when Philip came into Louis of Malle's territories, he began a process of restructuring the administration of his lands, and the Ducal Council of Dijon was at the center of his plans. The jurisdiction of the council in Dijon was expanded to encompass all of Philip's southern territories, the Franche-Comte, Nevers, the Champagne lands, and the other dependent territories that he held. In his early years as duke, Philip would appoint a governor to administer Burgundy while he was in Paris. But now Philip stopped appointing governors to the duchy in his absence and gave their responsibilities to the Dijon consul. Despite a governor no longer residing in Dijon, 
each of Philip's other southern territories now received one answerable to the Ducal Council. The Ducal Council was the linchpin of Philip's administration. To quote historian Richard Vaughan, it was the permanent representative of Philip the Bold's authority in the two Burgundies. It was one of the higher courts of justice, it controlled the financial organization and the civil service. It concerned itself with the domains, with general security, with the levying of taxes, with juridical questions, with the appointment of minor officials, with the coinage, with the counts. The domains, by the way, are just the lands directly owned and controlled by the duke. So let's break down a few of the Dijon Council's main responsibilities and its organization. The council was roughly split into a body focused on justice and one focused on finances. These two bodies overlapped in terms of membership and meeting place, but there was some level of partitioning. So let's look at justice first. The council often heard cases and appeals from the lower feudal jurisdictions. If you know anything about the pre-revolutionary French government, it's probably that there were a ton of overlapping and contradictory issues of jurisdiction. That was true in 1789, and it was true in 1386. There were overlapping local officials exercising justice that existed at the bottom of the hierarchy that ranged from the town mayors to castellans to manorial courts. Above these officials were the ducal bailiffs, who exercised justice within a bailiwick, a sub-regional division of which there were five in the duchy in 1386. Above the bailiffs were a handful of other courts that were specialized in different aspects of the law. Then there was the ducal council, and above that was the parlement in Bonn. At each level, cases could be heard initially or appealed from a lower court. Once a case reached Bonn, it could only be appealed to the Parlement in Paris. But as the dukes had much greater influence over the Bonn Parliament than the Paris Parliament, this process was discouraged. While this discouragement tended to be largely unsuccessful, Philip did manage to increase his control over the Bonn Parliament by ensuring that the president of the court would be a member of the ducal council rather than a royal official from the Paris Parlement. But Bonn was not the only seat of a parlement in the two Burgundies. The town of Dole in the county was also home to one. The government of the Franche Comté was far less sophisticated than that of the duchy, and the nobles were far more independent. So while the Valois dukes did not have the same level of direct control over the county, the Dole parlement still provided them with an alternative method of controlling justice. The key difference between the Bonn and Dole parlement was that as Dole was outside the official borders of the Kingdom of France, it was also outside the jurisdiction of the Paris Parlement, and in fact, outside the jurisdiction of any higher court. Philip the Bold didn't try to expand the Dole Parlement's jurisdiction to encompass all of his southern territories, and there were other parlements that occasionally met in the smaller peripheral territories. However, the Dole Parlement's sovereignty would be exploited by future dukes. Philip would attempt to rationalize and reform the exercise of justice in his territories. During his 1386 reforms, he made it so that the Parlement of Bonn and Dole would meet on a more regular basis and for longer terms. Later in his reign, he would appoint permanent presidents of the Parlement, where in the past, presidents were appointed only for a single session. As I mentioned earlier, these presidents were also often members of Philip's ducal council. Philip often gave multiple positions to single councillors, such as Antoine Chouffant, who in 1400 was simultaneously the president of the Dole Parlement, the Bonne Parlement, the Ducal Council at Dijon, and the Auditoire des Causes de Apport, one of the lower courts of appeals that I mentioned earlier. Philip used personnel more than positions to align the institutions of his lands. Not only were the high officials of the courts generally the same people, but the courts also shared clerks between them. But this is only covering one aspect of justice and governance. What about the day-to-day -day interactions? These were handled by the ducal bailiffs. I also brought up bailiffs on my episode about the Capetian dukes, and under the Valois, their positions changed a little. The Duchy of Burgundy was divided into five bailiwicks, later six once the county of Charolais was annexed into the duchy. The Franche-Comté was divided into two, and the county of Nevers was also divided into two. Therefore, the bailiff in the bailiwick represented a much more local form of ducal authority. Bailiffs were usually appointed from the middling or lower nobility. A high noble bailiff might try to use the position to form a power base independent from the duke, while a commoner bailiff would not be able to prosecute a noble due to the privileges of nobility. 
Under Philip, the bailiff's financial responsibilities were given to another officer, the receiver, which I will be discussing next. But the office was still responsible for representing ducal authority on the semi-local level. The bailiff acted as a combination police officer, prosecutor, and judge. He was also tasked with publishing ducal proclamations and enforcing the will of the duke or the ducal council. Now, these are not small tasks, and the bailiwick was not a tiny district, so the bailiff was not expected to act alone. Usually, he had a staff of a couple dozen who ranged from deputies to lawyers. The extensive powers of the bailiff on the local level definitely made the office easy to abuse. Complaints on bailiff corruption exist throughout the Burgundian period. This corruption was exacerbated by the Burgundian pay scheme. Pay was usually deducted from the receipts on the local level, so it could be uneven and late. But the bailiffs could easily supplement this unreliable income through fines and extortion. Additionally, salaries were usually quite small, and the Dukes of Burgundy would often impose a forced loan on their officers, making them turn their salary over to the central court. So, speaking of money, who handled the money? At the highest level, a subset of the ducal council, known as the Chambre des Comptes, or the Chamber of Accounts, named for the room where the account books were kept, handled the finances. I feel like I should also note that the Chamber of Accounts was what the financial center in Paris was called, and that Philip reformed his financial apparatus after commissioning a few members of the Paris Chamber of Accounts to advise him on the subject. The Chamber of Accounts was thus organized as its own entity during Philip's 1386 reorganizations of the Burgundian state. Here, Philip expanded its jurisdiction to cover all of his southern territories, outlined its duties and responsibilities, and organized the keeping and recording of the body's records. But this was not the Chamber of Accounts' origin. The body existed before 1386, and even after, it was not entirely separated from the ducal councils. Sometimes, decisions made by the chamber list a handful of both maîtres de compte, masters of accounts, and ducal council members that did not hold the position. But it should be noted that the chamber of accounts was more focused with financial oversight and auditing than controlling spending or receiving income. Spend was controlled by the ducal treasurer, and the collection of income was done on a more local level. Taxes and income from feudal rights and dues were collected on the most local level, the town, or fief, or castle. From there, minor officials would spend what they needed in order to keep the local administration running and send the rest up to a receiver. Each bailiwick had a receiver, who was responsible for keeping the finances of the bailiff-level government afloat, and sending the rest on to a receiver general who did the same on the duchy or county level. Above the receiver's general was the receiver general for all finances. So the receivers did not just receive. They spent money to support their level of government, but also when it was asked of them. Often, a receiver in a certain locale would get an order to purchase something for the central government or for the ducal court that had nothing to do with local governance. Therefore, to keep all the finances straight, Ducal officials and receivers at every level were made to keep detailed accounts and to submit them to the Chambre des Comptes on an annual basis for audit. But the receivers still did not account for all the income of the Duke. For example, aids, or extraordinary taxes voted to the Duke from representative institutions such as the Estates of Burgundy, were collected by special receivers appointed by those institutions. The Estates General were representative institutions made up of the three estates, the nobles, the clergy, and the commoners. Across France, the Estates General sometimes took slightly different forms, such as the nobles and clergy acting as a single group, or the peasants and townspeople being given separate representation. The Estates General could usually only meet when called into a session by their liege lord, which generally limited their independent power. But, they did often control aids or extraordinary taxes, and could use the opportunity that being called to vote on taxes gave them to voice concerns to their lord. The estates of Philip's southern lands generally had very little power. They were called to vote on aids and little else. Even their power to appoint special receivers tended to be deferred to ducal appointments. If there was one area of Philip's lands that did have a representative institution with some teeth, it was Flanders. So, now let's move north to examine Philip's government in the Low Countries. In general, the administration of Philip's northern territories reflected that of the administration of the Duchy of Burgundy. 
This had much to do with the fact that Philip had two decades to organize and get used to how the government of the duchy worked. That being said, there were some local particularities that did force differences in the governments. First and foremost of these particularities was the institution of the three members of Flanders. If you'll recall, the three members was formed during Jacob van Artevelde's revolt against Louis of Nevers. The three members were the three preeminent towns of Flanders, Ghent, Bruges, and Ypres, and each member represented a quarter, being the smaller towns and countryside that surrounded it. The major change to the three members that Philip made was to make it the four members by adding the Franc of Bruges to it. The Franc of Bruges was Bruges' quarter and was a primarily rural member. The Franc began to rise to importance during the older von Artevelde's revolt. It was a center of resistance to the Artevelde regime and support for the Count. The Franc had occasionally sat with the other members in the past, but in 1386, Philip permanently invited it to the meetings. Bruges was not happy that it could no longer speak for its castlery, but the Franc did not upset the balance of power too much. It was not, as the other members had initially feared, a way for the Count to push a lordly point of view over an urban one, and the voting patterns of the four members often did not show the Franc against the towns as much as the Franc and Ypres working against the more powerful Ghent and Bruges. Along with adding the Franc to the institution, Philip proclaimed that the four members could only meet when he allowed them to, hoping to subject them to the same subservience that the estates were under. However, the four members continued to meet whenever they wanted, meeting on average 30 times a year. In the end, the four members proved to be quite useful to Philip. It was a convenient way for him to interact with the powerful cities of Flanders. He could request and negotiate for aids from the four members rather than from the estates, as the four members would be the ones paying the bulk of any aid. However, the four members refused his requests more often than the estates would. Philip could also call on the body to help him negotiate trade agreements as he did with both England and the Hanseatic League. In fact, the four members were called upon by Philip so often that the estates of Flanders ended up being an afterthought. Even when they were called, the third estate, the commoners, were usually represented by the members anyway, and given the relative power of the towns of Flanders to the church and nobility, they ended up dominating the meetings. However, in Philip's other northern territories, the estates were not such an afterthought. In the counties of Artois and Rethel and the Duchy of Limburg, the estates were given similar standing to the Burgundian estates. That being said, the Burgundian estates were far from the center of the ducal government, but they were called regularly and had the opportunity to raise issues to the duke. At this point, the dukes of Burgundy had a very strong claim to the lands that they ruled, but we will see that as they gain more lands on which they had a more tenuous claim, they will rely more on the estates of those territories to legitimize their rule. Moving on from the representative institutions, we get to the center of the Burgundian Low Country Administration, Lille. Located in Gallican Flanders, Lille was more or less right at the center of Philip's northern lands. At Lille, Philip organized a council similar to the one in Dijon. As I just went over the Dijon Ducal Council, I won't go as much into how the Lille Council functioned, but will highlight some key differences between the two. The origins of the Lille Council lay with Louis of Malle. His commodal council originally met in Ghent, but when he was forced out during the Ghent War and fled to Lille, his council went with him. Philip, seeing Lille's central location and relatively loyal populace, for Flanders anyway, decided to keep the location. Louis of Malle's council began as an ad hoc collection of councillors, but as his reign continued, it began to take a structure similar to that of the Burgundian council. Membership became, if not permanent, more regular and specialized roles were given to some members. Therefore, when Philip received Louis's territories, the Commodal Council was already going through a process of rationalization. Philip continued this process. He made councillors more permanent, he set up a partitioned, if not entirely separate, Chambre de Comte, and he reorganized the levels of justice in his northern lands. The Chambre de Comte in Lille functioned almost exactly as it did in Dijon. The body was slightly more separated from the main council, but otherwise was the same body. Finances became one of the few aspects of governance in Flanders where Philip had firm control over the towns. 
His officers had the right to inspect and audit town accounts, and furthermore, a copy of those accounts had to be submitted to the Lille Chambre de Comte. It is with justice that we see the most difference between the northern and southern governments. Much of this has to do with how jurisdiction and feudal society evolved differently in the more densely urban low countries and in the rural Burgundy. In Burgundy, when Philip came to power, there was already an established hierarchy of courts that centered around the duke. Philip added some layers and made certain courts specialize in some aspects of law, but he did not radically change how justice was administered. In Flanders, however, the cities prevented Philip from controlling justice in the same way. If you'll recall, one of a city's most important rights was the right to control justice within that city and when one of its citizens was charged with a crime. This meant that Philip had little to no control of how the law was applied within the walls of a city. Moreover, many of the cities of Flanders had a large number of external burgesses, or citizens who did not live in that city. The cities claimed rights of justice over these burghers, and so even if Philip wanted to sit in judgment over something that occurred outside of a city, he could not always do so without a fight. Conversely, the feudal courts of justice of the lower nobility were far weaker than they were in the two Burgundies. They did exist, but were largely outside of Philip's jurisdiction, apart from the occasional appeal, and were largely ignored. So, we will be ignoring them as well. One of the tools that Philip could use to control justice was the audience. The audience was another of Louis of Mala's innovations, and was a special session of the Commodal Council that could be called specifically to act as a court. As the audience was already an established precedent when Philip became count, it would not be met with the same suspicion that Philip's reformed commodal council would. In fact, the differences between the audience and the commodal council were mostly superficial. The two bodies shared the same members, responsibilities, and jurisdiction. Once again, quoting Richard Vaughan, quote, the main difference between the two divisions of this court lay in the fact that the audience was merely a court, while the Chambre de Conseil, as we have seen, had other and more important functions. The judicial attributions of the council, whether it sat in audience or the Chambre, were identical. Another key difference between the governance of Philip's northern and southern lands was the status of the bailiff. In the northern territories, the office of bailiff did not have the same judicial authority that it had in the south. Bailiffs still acted as officers of the law and could call judicial sessions, but they could only prosecute, not decide a defendant's fate. The towns of Flanders tended to have a generally antagonistic relationship with the Count's bailiffs. Issues of both jurisdiction and corruption were constantly brought to the Count, and on many occasions the towns set up councils in an attempt to oversee the bailiffs. This happened under Jacob van Artevelde's tenure as Master of Flanders and in the early days of the Ghent War. Flemish bailiffs did keep the same administrative powers that they held in the south. Like in the two Burgundies, the Low Country bailiffs were answerable to both the Duke and the Council. But unlike in the two Burgundies, the bailiffs of the north also answered to another office, the Sovereign Bailiff. The Sovereign Bailiff, like many other of the Low Country institutions brought up already, was created by Louis of Mala. Originally, the sovereign bailiff was created more as an officer with a wide competence meant to prosecute crimes against the count that didn't fall under the jurisdiction of existing institutions. And unlike the other Flemish bailiffs, the sovereign bailiff had the power to judge cases. As the years went on, the sovereign bailiff's authority was increased to oversee the other bailiffs of Flanders. The Sovereign Bailiff proved to be a useful tool in Louis's and later Philip's jurisdiction conflicts with the cities of Flanders. The Sovereign Bailiff had wide latitude to pardon people brought up on charges by the cities and could even rescind banishments given by the towns, although he could not force a town to let a person back within its walls. While Philip's two regional governments met in Dijon and Lille, the Duke spent most of his time in Paris. The French capital was equidistant from his northern and southern territories, and while it wasn't on the direct path between the two, Paris's proximity to both territories and the quality of the roads towards Paris made it one of the best places for him to be. In Paris, Philip stayed at either the Hôtel d'Artois or the Hôtel de Conflans. Both hôtels were inherited from the Capetian Burgundians. The Hôtel d'Artois was within the city walls, while the Hôtel de Conflans was just outside it. 
Out of the two, the Hôtel d'Artois was the larger one, and many members of the ducal household could live alongside the duke there. The ducal household was the center of the central government such that it existed. The central government was generally much more ad hoc than the regional governments were. At this level, everything centered on the duke himself. There was a council, or a grand conseil, but it was really just the name given to whatever group of advisors that the duke had around him. Unlike the regional councils, there were no permanent members of this council. There was no clerk and records were not kept in the same detail. But this is not to say that there was no organization at the uppermost level. One of Philip's innovations was his creation of the office of chancellor. Chancellors had existed in both Burgundy and Flanders in the past, but Philip's office was different than these were. Philip's chancellor would live in Paris with the duke and act as an intermediary between the duke and the councils of Dijon and Lille. Quoting Richard Vaughan yet again, the chancellor, quote, occupied himself with all aspects of the government, whether financial, domanial, political, or religious, and his advice and decision were constantly sought by the rest of the administration. He was the linchpin of the state, and it is in his activities and powers that its unity is most apparent. The chancellor and duke worked closely together to direct the Burgundian state both north and south. To do so, they were constantly sending messengers between Paris and their territories. Any member of the ducal court could be sent. Squires, secretaries, chamberlains, and counselors were all tasked with various missions by the duke. These positions tended to overlap, and the main difference tended to be the missions that the officers undertook. A counselor in Paris might be called a secretary if they were sent to Dijon, or a chamberlain if they were sent to Brabant. More often than not, the counselors found themselves with areas of specialty, but they were not exclusively used in these areas. Being on hand tended to be the most important qualification for a given mission. The financial arm of the central administration was made up of three components. These were the treasurer, the receiver general of all finances, and the chambre aux deniers. We've already brought up the receivers a few times, so let's start with the receiver general of all finances. This office was right above the regional receivers and functioned quite similarly to them. Despite being at the top of the receiver hierarchy, the receiver general of all finances handled very little of the ducal revenues and expenditures himself. This was partly due to the sheer difficulty in transporting large amounts of cash from the territories to and from Paris. Instead, a system of credits and debits were used where, when the central government needed to spend money, the receiver general of all finances would order one of the more local receivers to make the purchase and then count that amount as an expense to the local receiver's account. What made the central receiver different from the others was that he could draw funds from all of the accounts of the duke's domains, while the regional receivers could only draw funds from the receivers answerable to them. As the central receiver was the one tasked with organizing the expenditure of the central government and the duke's elaborate household and court, he needed to be able to spread the, at times extravagant, expenses around. However, at a time before annual budgets and for a prince with expensive tastes, the tax revenues from the Burgundian realm were often not enough to cover all of Philip's spending. Therefore, loans were needed. I'll talk more about the credit system of the late medieval world in a future episode, but I do want to introduce the Rapondi family. The Rapondi were an Italian merchant and banking family from the city of Lucca. They had offices in both Paris and Bruges and were close allies of Philip the Bold. Much of his financial overreaches would be covered by Dino Rapondi and his family's company. If the receiver general of all finances was the one in charge of figuring out how to pay for the duke's needs, the treasurer was the one charged with calculating the expenditures. When the duke wanted to make a purchase, he told the treasurer who calculated how much everything would cost and then passed the debit amount to the central receiver. All expenses from the ducal household and central government had to go through the treasurer, and although the treasurer did not keep his own accounts, he did supervise those of the receivers. But the treasurer was not tasked with auditing accounts. In fact, the receiver general of all finances accounts were audited by the Dijon Chambre de Comptes. However, the audits of the day-to-day -day ducal expenses were given to the last of the duke's central financial institutions, the Chambre aux Duniers. This chamber was essentially the equivalent of the Chambre de Comptes for the ducal household. But, given that at this time, the line dividing the ducal household and the ducal government was essentially non-existent, it ended up supervising most of the expenses of the central government's day-to-day -day operations. 
The Chambre Odonier was made up of Maitre d'Hôtel and Maitre de la Chambre, both being officers tasked with various auditing and supervisory roles. The chamber was tasked with verifying both wages paid to officers of the court and members of the ducal household, and expenditures made by various parts of the household. Clerks were tasked with recording these expenses, and as time went on and Philip gained more land, prestige, and access to funds, you can see the literal size of the account books expanding. In the 1370s, three 15 by 7 inch pages were enough for the Duke's daily expenses, but by the 1380s, these expenses needed five 24 by 9 pages. In general, we see a fairly decentralized picture of ducal finances. Funds were collected and more often than not spent at the local level, but at all levels we see accounts being carefully kept and audited. Additionally, we shouldn't underestimate the central direction that expenditure had. Philip the Bold was a lavish spender, and both the treasurer and receiver general of all finances were often tasked with figuring out how to pay for and spread around huge payments. Finally, we reach justice at the central level. Unlike administration and finance, this was not controlled by the Duke, but rather by the Paris Parlement. I mentioned earlier that as the Duke did not control the Paris Parlement, he did his best to discourage petitioners from the Bon or Lille courts from appealing to Paris, but this was often unsuccessful. So when petitions from the Duke's domains did reach Paris, he was ready to defend his interests. The Duke was intimately tied to the King's administration for most of his life, and so had a lot of influence both over the royal court and the Paris Parlement. But influence was not always enough to defend the Duke's interests. At Paris, the Duke maintained a staff of avocats and procureurs, legal experts tasked with looking after Philip's interests in the royal courts. Highlighting the Duke's influence over the Paris Parlement, two of his procureurs eventually became presidents of the court. As Philip was a peer of the realm, he had the right to ensure that any case brought against him was heard by the Paris Parlement, rather than at a lower royal court. But when cases were brought against him outside of his territories, and not through royal courts, he had a staff of legal experts to defend his rights there too. Such was the organization of the Burgundian administration. But was it a state? To be honest, I really don't know. The administration of Philip the Bold was definitely less complex, centralized, and efficient than that of Philip the Good, and there's a lot of good arguments for and against the idea of a Burgundian state under the latter Philip. For the record, Richard Vaughn, who so heavily influenced this episode, is firmly pro-existence of a state, and I tend to lean that way as well. Without getting into all the philosophizing about what is and what is not a state, I do want to highlight some things about the Burgundian administration. First of all, it was centrally controlled and hierarchical. The Duke may not have had absolute authority over everything that happened in his realm, but he did have the ability to exercise power over the lower rungs of his government. Power ultimately flowed from the Duke rather than the institutions themselves. In fact, the power of the central government came from its role in directing the regional governments and had few distinct responsibilities other than supplying the Duke with money. Additionally, it should be noted that while the central government had authority over the regional and local governments, that did not mean that it could direct the entire Burgundian realm at once. If Philip wanted to issue an ordonnance for his northern territories, he had to issue one for Artois, one for Flanders, and one for Rethel. Taxes were an even more involved affair, with new taxes having to be approved by the estates for each region and more often than not requiring some sort of negotiation in each territory. Secondly, the administration was quite complex for the time. There were levels of government and, more importantly, institutions of accountability. These institutions are most obvious in the literal bodies of accountants, but every body at every level of the administration had some other body tasked with overseeing it, with the exception of the Duke himself and the Chancellor. Finally, we see that the Burgundian state of the 1380s and 1390s, such that it exists, is consciously copying the French state, such that it exists. We saw how this process began under the Capetian dukes, and how Philip the Bold is continuing it. This can be explained in part by Philip's proximity to the central French government. As first peer of the realm, he was supposed to live in Paris. As son, brother, and uncle of three successive French kings, he was intimately tied to the highest levels of the government. And, as a member of Charles VI's Regency Council for the past few years, Philip had spent time getting used to how it worked. And, the French organization had benefits apart from familiarity, 
It may not have been the most organized state, or proto-state if you prefer, in Europe, but it was quite well organized for the late Middle Ages, Hundred Years' War and plague-related stresses notwithstanding. France's monarch was rich and powerful, and the state he led could be quite effective in the right hands. So, what we end up seeing is something akin to a composite monarchy. A composite monarchy is essentially a collection of separate territories that share a ruler. These territories are generally governed separately and according to their own laws. A good example of a composite monarchy in the Middle Ages would be the Angevin Empire, but many more will pop up as we reach the early modern period, notably the union of Castile and Aragon into Spain. Philip is not in charge of Flanders because he is the Duke of Burgundy. He is in charge of Flanders because he is the Count of Flanders. Well, technically because his wife is the Countess of Flanders. We see that under Philip the Bold, the actual legal institutions of his territories were not changed, but new layers were added on top of, and at least according to Philip, superior in jurisdiction to existing ones. These new institutions could oversee multiple territories and are what laid the foundation for a more unified Burgundian state in the future. The administration organized by Philip the Bold will be built upon and refined by his successors. As the land controlled by the Burgundian dukes expands, so will the reach and power of their state apparatus. Thus far, I've done my best this episode to avoid extrapolating backwards from the administrations of Philip the Good and Charles the Bold. Philip the Bold was an incredibly ambitious man, but I find it unlikely that he would have predicted how the course of Burgundy would play out. It's important to see how the institutions begun by Philip the Bold evolved and influenced the later Duke's government, but we shouldn't be looking for something that didn't exist yet. Hopefully, now you have a decent understanding of the Burgundian state under Philip the Bold such that it existed. But the governing apparatus is only part of the picture. Next episode, I want to take you through the lands that Philip ruled. I have thus far been mentioning duchies and counties without too much explanation of what and where they are, so I intend to change that. However, next time will be in four weeks rather than two, as I am moving this month, and much of the time that I would usually dedicate to this show will instead be dedicated to packing, cleaning, and unpacking. After that, we will dive into the splendid courts of the Burgundian Dukes and the world of high art in late medieval France. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, I would really appreciate it if you would rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice and tell your friends about it. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me on twitter.com slash Burgundy or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website at granddukesofthewest.com.